so this is another um, bit of perspective for people who think they know how the justice system works. For people who, you know, there's been comments that have been made um, by many people that say things like, well, you must have done something, or they must have something on you. They wouldn't do this unless there was something there. And, you know, it's really easy to think that when it's not happening to you. <clears throat> and all I can say is I hope it never does happen to you because you'll find out the truth that people will make judgments and they will assume uh, negative things. It's easy for people to make those leaps. And uh, I know many people, I'm related to a bunch of them that are extremely judgmental. And it's one of the reasons I don't, you know, share this information with everybody. I put it out there for the world to see in, in a transparent way so that those that have a negative judgment will probably not come around to me and share it. Those types of people tend to not have the integrity to stand behind what they do. But the reality is, is the justice system is very unbalanced. We think about Lady Liberty and justice as, as you know, this, this impartial uh, lady who's blindfolded and carries a scale. And the concept of that is that justice is uh, objective. That doesn't bring her own perspective into things. And uh, in, a, in an equal way, the defense and the prosecution can bring the evidence into the trial and place it on the scale for the jury to see and to balance it out. And whichever side it comes out is going to be you know, the, the decision. And that makes sense. And that's what I think a lot of us really believe goes on. And I imagine in some cases it does. But more and more and in more and more types of cases and in more different courthouses and courtrooms, not just because of bad laws, but, but because of corruption or because of personal agendas, I, I believe that justice is sort of slipping out of our fingers. And so here's an example or a, <clears throat> a snapshot into a courtroom, all right? So imagine walking into a courtroom or being carried, you know, walking in in shackles and prison garb or walking in on your own freedom. And you look forward and there's this wooden little wall, little pony wall with a door. And on one side of this wall is the gallery, the spectators, and where anybody has the freedom to come in. On the other side of this is a big table, and on the other side of the table is a big, you know, the, the judge's uh, spot. I don't know what they call it, a dais or something like that, the judge's, the judge's place. To the right is a series of, of seats, and oftentimes to the left there would be a series of seats for the jury and witnesses. The lawyers and the defendant and the... The prosecution gets to sit at this table in front of the judge, and to the right, there's uh, a place where um, all of the prosecution witnesses are able to sit. So you think about this, the prosecution witnesses are able to sit in the courtroom during everything. The defense witnesses are unable to do that. So right off the bat, there's this little bit of impartiality. Why does, why does the prosecution's witnesses, oftentimes law enforcement, able to sit and watch the whole trial? Well, the defense's witnesses has to stay outside. Okay, um, You walk into court and they have rules of conduct where you're unable to do anything but sit there and pay attention. You're not allowed to read a book. You're not allowed to... Uh, have a cell phone, you're not allowed to talk to anybody, you're not allowed to do anything other than just be there. You can write notes. But then you get into the courtroom, and on the other side of that, you have detectives and attorneys, you know, the prosecution's attorneys and, and the, the cops, the witnesses, are constantly going through their cell phones and typing out text messages, and Bailiffs are reading books and sometimes doing bills, and there's lots of crosstalk and drinking coffee 
and all sorts of things. And you think to yourself, well, that seems kind of trite, kind of insignificant, but what it does is it sets the stage. It sets this this one-sidedness, especially to a defendant who has a public defender, a public pretender. It, it, it sort of shows the the bias of this court and the, the way that what you have to deal with, what you're up against. Okay, you got this one side that gets to do whatever they want, and the other side, if you happen to have some support, uh, you are completely bound. You're unable to do anything whatsoever. Most of the time, a defendant has nobody with them, so it's just the defendant and their attorney and maybe a family member, and the whole other side of the courtroom is, is apparently on the same team. They're not supposed to be, but apparently are. And then you stop and you think about the, the cost imbalance of this. All of these people, these cops, that take the day off to go to court. I used to have an uncle that was a cop, and he used to talk all the time, oh, I've got to go to court today, like it was this big deal. But the reality was, it's kind of a day off. They get to sit in a room, an air place. They get to hang out with their buddies, and they get paid for it. Okay? The prosecutors, they can delay things and, and time after time after time, well, we're not ready for this, we're not ready for that, so they can they can show up court every single time they want, no big deal. They get paid for it. Judge, it's just another day at work for the judge. Bailiffs, um, court reporters, all of those people are just going to work. Well, then you take and look at the other side, and even in a situation where you're doing well, you have a good job, Every single time that you have to go to court, you have to take time off of work. Uh, I'm looking at a three-week trial, maybe four weeks, which case I have to be in court every day. I'll have to leave my house at 5 o'clock in the morning, and if I get home at all that day, I'll, I'll probably not get home till you know 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And... I have a botanical garden and nursery that's going to sit on hold and hopefully it'll stay alive. I've got animals to take care of, um, you know, not to mention dealing with household things like paying bills. There won't be any money coming into the household during that time. I won't have any ability. I can only hope that things will stay together. This is, this is the thing that a defendant has to deal with. And then if they're able to pull together support, all of these same people have the same hardships. The gas money to come down there, the parking, the food, and, and sacrifice that it takes for court support to occur, it comes out of our pocket. It comes out of our time, out of our ability to be a, a father or a husband or a wife or a mother. And you got to put it all on hold and if you're going to be able to participate in this. And then the other side, and here's kind of the twist that really makes it unfair or un one-sided, is that all of these people are getting paid from us. So we have to pony up for the attorney. We have to pony up to take the time off of work. We have to pay for the gas. We have to pay for the bail. We have to pay for everything just to bring ourselves there. But the other side of it is it's our tax dollars that's paying for them to fight against us. And think about that for a second, okay? When you think that there's a justice system occurring, um, you know, think about all of the money, you know, that's always sort of the balance that people say when there's a questionable thing going on. They always say, follow the money, see who's doing what. See where the, see what's getting supported by what. And realize that we're being tapped in to go after ourselves and to strip ourselves of our own resources and it's just an ongoing cycle and I don't know what the answer to it is other than if more people are aware of this um, they might have more of a voice they might uh, reach deep inside and, and, and take a, maybe another look at, at where their priorities are and what they're doing uh, this is something that I didn't know myself I, until I got roped into this. And most people I know, 
they get into the justice system, they just want to get out of it as fast as they can and go back to their lives. And I got to tell you, if everybody continues to do that, the prison population of America right now runs about 10% of our population. The world's prisoners, we run about 25%. America has 25% of the world's prisoners and 10% of our own population in prison. That number is only going to go up, and one day it's going to be you, and I don't want to see that happen. So we've got to stand together and find a way to participate in our local government, in our state government, our federal government, and vote and let your voice be heard. We can't let these injustices continue. So be the solution. Get out there and do something. Thank you.